Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure on behalf of Zohrot to uh, welcome everyone who is uh, attending this event today. Um, Palestinian return, Jewish accountability in conversation with Israeli and Jewish voices. Um, it's a great pleasure and, and honor to uh, uh, be present today with um, a very uh, distinguished uh, a group of speakers, um, all Israeli or uh, uh, Jewish from different places around the world, who are going to uh, share with us their thoughts um, about Palestinian return. And when we um, discuss Palestinian return, um, um, usually we are mainly uh, talking about the victims of the Palestinian Nakba. The term Nakba refers to, um, uh, it's, it means catastrophe in Arabic, actually, and it is an important term uh, in, uh, in the Palestinian uh, history and present. Uh, we, I'm a Palestinian myself, let me maybe introduce myself first. My name is Munir Nusaiba. I'm a professor of international law at al Quds University. Um, and I also uh, uh, tea, uh, I, and I also uh, head a center in Jerusalem that also belongs to al Quds University called Community Action Center that provides legal aid to Palestinians, uh, uh, many of whom are uh, victims of what we call the continuous Nakba, uh, uh, the continuous displacement of the Palestinian people from their homes, uh, whether in Jerusalem or in, in, in the West Bank or in other areas. So I am uh, involved in my uh, uh, continuous work with, uh, in, in my work with continuous displacement. Um, so uh, the Nakba is uh, uh, the event that happened back uh, uh, in 1948 or between 1947 and 1949. We refer to it usually as the 1948 war in which um, uh, the state of Israel was established on 78% of mandatory Palestine. And uh, during that uh, event, 80% uh, of the Palestinian population who lived in the area that became Israel during that war uh, were forcibly displaced from their homes uh, and became uh, uh, refugees living in refugee camps uh, actually until the current day. Um, in the aftermath of the Nakba, um, uh, the Israeli uh, state authorities um, made sure that they prevent, that the state prevents the return of um, all those who were displaced during the war. This happened through um, using their police forces um, and border control, but also through a number of laws, like a law that is called prevention of infiltration law that criminalized any attempted return of refugees to their homes, uh, like denying these refugees from citizenship and basically excluding them from the um, organic community that uh, existed before uh, the establishment of the state. The state of Israel, continues, um, ha has continued since the Nakba until today um, to deny uh, first the forcible displacement of all these Palestinians, but more, you know, equally importantly, to, de to deny that these refugees have a right of return, uh, despite universal recognition uh, for the uh, almost universal recognition for the right of return, the UN General Assembly, um, um, and, and Generally, in international human rights law and international humanitarian law, the right of return is uh, is a guaranteed right for uh, um, people who were displaced to return, whether from Palestine or from anywhere else around the world. However, from the point of view of uh, the state of Israel, uh, uh, this uh, the, uh, this is a denied right, uh, denied story, uh, denied truth um, uh, on a on a continuous uh, basis. Um, when you um, dig deeper into, into this denial, you understand that there is a lot of, um, uh, th that the main idea behind this denial is uh, the worry that this, the return might change uh, the status of the state from being a Jewish state into being just a state. Um, and uh, this is an issue that has continued to um, um, uh, be one of the basic obstacles uh, towards establishing any um, uh, peace 
in this uh, region, and I believe it will uh, uh, continue uh, to be like that. However, the uh, narrative uh, and the denial that the state has insisted to uh, conduct uh, since the Nakba is not shared by uh, um, all the Israelis or all the Jews around the world. Of course, Zuchrot, the, or the organization that is currently um, organizing uh, this event, um, uh, certainly um, works on first remembering the Nakba, talking about the Nakba, documenting the Nakba from original voices, uh, Palestinian voices, Israeli voices, so documenting this Nakba, but um, also uh, equally importantly, um, calling for the right of return as part of, of the organization's uh, official um, goals and official mission that the, those who have been displaced um, um, must have the right to return to their homes, uh, uh, must exercise the right to return home. They have the right, but they must be able to exercise this right. Uh, but Zuchrot is, uh, uh, is also, um, there are also other uh, Israelis and Jews around the world who support this right out of principle, out of, uh, um, uh, you know, of morals. And today I am uh, very much honored to um, be um, discussing this topic with our three uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, who I will uh, introduce shortly. Um, this event uh, as, uh, is, is, um, is online uh, on, on, on Zoom, but also on Facebook. Um, all of uh, our uh, attendees in, uh, in the Zoom platform are invited to uh, ask questions um, using the Q&A uh, button after, um, you know, um, um, uh, because we will have 15 minutes at the end of the event uh, for uh, questions uh, from the audience. But in the first one hour, it will be basically a conversation uh, between me and uh, our three distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, so let me uh, introduce our speakers and then uh, um, uh, ask them questions and learn from their experiences, learn from their thoughts. I'm very much excited and looking forward actually to, uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, our speakers are um, Professor Peter uh, uh, Beinart. Uh, he is a professor of journalism and political science at the City University of New York. He is also the editor at large of Jewish Currents, a CNN political commentator, a frequent contributor to the New York Times, and a non-resistant fellow, uh, resident, sorry, <laughs> fellow, um, at the foundation of Middle East Peace. He writes uh, the Benart Notebook newsletter on uh, subtac.com. Uh, our uh, second uh, speaker is Dr. Ina Mikhaeli, a feminist activist and sociologist, born in St. Petersburg, uh, raised in Haifa and lives in Berlin. Um, Ina has been taking part in Palestinian solidarity actions for the past 20 years. She is a board member of Jewish Voices for a Just Peace in Germany. Ina is part of a new grassroots initiative uh, of Israelis against apartheid. Uh, and our, our final uh, speaker is Dr. Aviram uh, Zoref, a postdoctoral fellow of the uh, Polonsky Academy at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. His research deals with the history of Jewish Arab relations in in Ottoman and mandatory Palestine and in the demand for the return of Palestinian refugees and resistance to Israeli martial law during the 1950s. Um, uh, I um, welcome our uh, uh, three speakers and uh, uh, very much uh, thank all of you for um, your um, speaking to us today about this important topic. Um, and I would like to uh, start um, by asking a question to all of you. Um, and the question is, why should we support Palestinian return from your point of view? So I will start with Ina, ladies first, and I will hear from the others later. Please, Ina, if you can 
kindly unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Munir, and uh, hi, hi, um, everybody. And it's, uh, it's nice to see a full room for this conversation and also uh, so many names that are unfamiliar to me. So that's, that's also great to, um, to see all the and new friends. And in response to your question, Munir, on why we should support, um, let, me, let me tell you why I think we should actively support Palestinian uh, return. And it is because if we don't support it, we participate in the silencing and the denial, the denial of the displacement of which you were talking about. And we become complicit in the expulsion of people from their ancestral home and land and in maintaining people's status and reality as refugees. So we, we become complicit in this crime. But I also want to say that even just the question, should we or shouldn't we support Palestinian return exposes the injustice of the entire situation. Because if we understand return to one's home, to one's land uh, after expulsion and, and ethnic cleansing as a basic human right, why should the rights of the Palestinian people depend on what Ina or what anyone thinks? It, um, it seems to me the core of the problem is the supremacist patterns of thinking that lead us to believe that we have the right to deny other people their rights. And if I can make an analogy, a personal analogy to LGBTIQ rights, it's of course nice that people support my rights, but part of me also asks, excuse me, who gave you the power to support or not support my rights? And why should my life require your support or permission? So um, there's something even just in, in the setting of this conversation that, that exposes the injustice of the situation, but unfortunately it is the reality um, and it is the reality of denial and we, we do have to um, speak up. And perhaps um, just one more point to it that I, I came um, as a child with my family to um, Israel, um, Palestine, uh, by the law of return that, gra that grants citizenship to Jews and descendants of Jews. And so imagine that as a Jewish girl from St. Petersburg, I could receive citizenship, Israeli citizenship from one day to another and grow up in Haifa. And needless to say, nobody told me Haifa is a Palestinian city or what its history or what is the Nagba. But at the same time, Palestinians, even, even here in Berlin where I, I live now, Palestinians whose families lived in Haifa for generations and were expelled seven decades ago, cannot not just return, but even come and visit their homes. So the injustice of this situation is so obvious and there's an ongoing process to replace one population with another. And it's a terrible project that brings trauma for generations to come. So um, the sooner we move away from it, the better. Thank you, thank you, Ina. Um, Aviram, same question. Okay, thank you, Munir. Uh, so, I start with continuing what uh, Ina said. That uh, what I think is that the starting point for the to answer the question is that first and foremost, Palestinians return to the homeland is a just fulfillment of their own right. It's not, uh, but if the is why we and I'm referring to myself, we as and a privileged Israeli Jew in Israel should have an interest in making the justice. This I think derives from the fact that Palestinian return as a major part of the broader process of decolonization. You mentioned the continuous Akba. serve actually is a tool also in the decolonization of Jewish existence in Palestine itself. Now, what I, I, I just try to explain what I mean by decolonizing Jewish existence in Palestine. That I mean the option to untangle the connection that Israeli Jews usually identify between being and being colonial, and with existence and violent victory. And this can be achieved by what Reif Zrecht termed as a surgery for taking the national uh, Jewish flesh outside of the settler colonial skeleton. Now, our current existence in Israel as Jews is stipulated by the ongoing situation of colonial power relation and ethnic Jewish supremacy, which should be said also inflicts the internal Jewish ethnic and class hierarchies. A Palestinian return, which is a deviation from the ongoing Zionist aspiration for gaining more and more lands while displacing their Arab residents and its colonial driving force of creating a Jewish majority, 
uh, will force us to find a different basis for a political collective Jewish existence in Palestine within a new and equal political framework. Now, th uh, this option is, tell me when to stop, yes? Um, so, and this can be achieved uh, only by gaining, uh, by the recognition of the indigenous population of the land in Jewish existence and the, uh, and the exp expelled uh, indigenous population of the land. And I'm not, I'm of course not, um, not relating here to the kind of recognition that former Prime Minister Netanyahu sought to gain, and of course not to the recognition that Zionist movement enjoyed all the time of the colonial authorities, uh, which is that uh, it's a consistent source of legitimization. Another point that I want to make is that the dismantling of the colonial structures means also the evaluation of a different understanding of Jewish collectivity beyond its Zionist secularized and nationalized versions and its notions of being in Palestine, now, which Zionist notion of return to the land was imagined as a return to a biblical and sovereign Eretz Israel, in which Palestinians were considered as mere fossils and remnants of a fetishized and glorious ancient past, as Bashar Adumani uh, named it uh, in 1992, Jewish traditional notions and pictures of Eretz Israel, of Palestine, were embedded within the contemporary political and cultural aspects of Palestine. Therefore, I think they enable the reimagination of the interconnection of Palestine and Eretz Israel, and instead of Zionists settling off or colonizing Palestine, the colonized traditional Jewish notions of the land can serve as a basis for thinking of Jews who are living in and not taking, settling, colonizing. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avram. Uh, Peter. Uh, if you could. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, sorry. Um, um, I'm just going to, in an act of uh, self promotion, just uh, mention that you mentioned my newsletter, so I'm just going to put the link in the, uh, in the chat. Um, um, uh, the, um, I agree with what, uh, what Ina and Aviram said, and, and so not to repeat you know, what they said, certainly I think it's, it's the case that um, Palestinians don't need Jews to legitimize the, their right to return home, and yet certainly in the United States where I live, oftentimes it is the case that Jews have more access to the public conversation about this than do Palestinians. Um, and so part of the challenge of being a kind of a, 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 a Jewish person in the media, in the public discourse in the United States is the question of how one uses that privilege um, uh, that, that one has that Palestinian Americans often don't have. And I certainly also agree with Avi Ram, I think he was implying, which is that Ultimately, justice and Palestinian return as part of justice is crucial for peace, and 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 peace benefits both Palestinians and Jews. But I would I would add, just because it hasn't been said, that I think when when one thinks about how to speak inside the Jewish community, and I, I particularly think inside the the American Jewish community, which is the community in which I live, and how to try to move a conversation, which is right now largely a brick wall in terms of the question of Palestinian right of return. It's val it, I've found that it, it can be valuable to try to draw not only on questions like international law and basic notions of human rights as important as those are, but also to try to draw our, our own traditions of the cherishing of memory of a place, of longing for it, and of organizing return. Now, that is not to say that, the, that, that Jewish return to you know, Eretz Israel after 2000 years is the same as Palestinian return to a place that a Palestinian lived in 1948 or their parents or grandparents. They're different in, in many, many important ways. And yet there is this irony that, um, that we were a people in diaspora that cherished the notion of a homeland and memory. And that I think that is, there is within that Jewish tradition, if used, if appealed to in the right way, a way of bringing a kind of empathy and understanding of Palestinian humanity and of the basic human desire and, and, and just human desire to want to return to a place that you're from uh, in a way that really right now in the American Jewish conversation really does not really exist. So the degree that Palestinian refugee return is imagined at all, it's imagined as um, a, a kind of a, a violent, threatening, dangerous process that can only lead to Jewish death or, 
or, um, or subjugation, um, uh, rather than as starting with, with, a, uh, with, starting with, the, with the basic human desire to, to return to the place that you or your family were, were from and to not forget about that place, which again is something that I think many Jews, many American Jews can actually understand. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, my, my second question to also all of you, and I'll actually start with, with you, Peter, uh, if, uh, if that's okay. Um, I want to ask about your relationship with Zionism growing up. Um, how important was it to you? And what made you start asking questions about it? Um, I could even uh, hear um, uh, from your answer um, some of the heritage somehow, at least from my own ears, and sure. I'm a Palestinian, of course, so I have Palestinian ears. <laughs> so in my, uh, from my own ears, I could see that heritage. Uh, yeah. uh, also informing you, you're using your, you know, that, that type of heritage, yeah. informing you to even defend the Palestinian right to return. But, you know, if you could tell me, how do you, um, you know, how, how do you relate to, to, to this growing up until today? I mean, I, I think, you know, my upbringing um, probably was one that would be shared by many diaspora Jews, um, uh, particularly, I would say, those whose families had not been in the United States for a long time, um, um, which was um, the sense that from many of my older relatives that life in the diaspora was precarious, that you just didn't know, even if things were good today, you didn't know how long that would last. You know, my grandmother was a very formative influence on me. She was born in Egypt, then she moved of all places to the Belgian Congo, and then in South Africa. And she she had this experience of being on the move, of not really trusting any that any environment was really going to be particularly safe or permanent. Um, and and even though you know her some of her family went to went to Palestine, what became Israel, although she didn't, that was for her psychologically the um, the the source of stability. You know, um, and I remember these conversations I would have with her as a child where I would always say to her, you know, America is different. America is great. You know, you don't have to worry about it. If anything bad happens, you can always come to America. And she would get very angry at me. You know, she really she really thought this was a very dangerous form of, you know, false consciousness about any diaspora society. So that's the way I was raised. Um, um, and um, and I think. Um, to some degree, uh, although I've rethought many, many things that I believed as a child and many things that I believed as an adult, I also think that, um, uh, you know, having had that experience um, most of my life and still being surrounded in communities where that is the dominant view um, is, is important in being able to have a conversation with other, uh, in my case, particularly with other American Jews who will have been raised in often a similar way. If you don't, if you don't respond to where people to the anxieties and fears and deep kind of beliefs that people have been raised with and grown up with, if you just ignore them in your discourse, in my experience, you don't get very far. Now, I may not get very far anyway, but, um, um, but so I feel like that, 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 um, that was a very much part of my, of my upbringing. And again, like many other American or diaspora Jews, the pa Palestinian existence, Palestinian, the Palestinian story, Palestinian was just not part of was not part of the experience. You know, um, uh, was not part of the story. And so again, part of the the whole way the story worked was by was precisely because Palestinians were not part of it. Um, and I would say, belatedly, too late in my adulthood, um, uh, that started to change. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, Aviram. Okay, so um, I, I uh, grew up in the religious Zionist education system in Israel. While my parents took an active part in the religious Zionist leftist movement, such as Meimad or Netivot Shalom, uh, now this gap between my own home and my social circle created a limited space for raising questions regarding the educational indoctrination of the rightist ideology of greater Eretz Israel, Eretz Israel Ashlema, in my school or youth movement. Nevertheless, however, I did not set any basis for uh, asking questions on the Zionist colonial structure as a whole. The basis for this question came from my growing awareness during my high school years as a, and as a descendant of an Iraqi Jewish family from my father's side to the Mizrahi struggle and critical discourse in Israel. 
Uh, my, my acquaintance with issues of proletarianization, the history of the formation of ethnic inequality in Israel, and the Ashkenazi oppressions of uh, Mizrahi uprisings, as well as the discussion of the Zionist discourse of elimination of Jewish diasporas in the Arab countries, that enabled to examine Jewish immigration from these countries, including my father's families, outside of the Zionist framework of the ingathering of the exiles. Um, so all of this uh, created the basis for the examination of the broader framework of colonial relations, of which I was, and still, of course, an integral part. Now, it pointed to the connections between the Zionist oppression of Palestinians and Ashkenazi oppression of Mizrahim. Now, this connection is not unidirectional, of course, but is, it is a matrix of, uh, of similarities in Orientalist discourses, colonizing efforts, and the evaluation of an ethnocratic, ethnocratic regime in which Mizrahim and Palestinians plays, play different, though interconnected, roles. This brought me later to study the writing of, uh, of an essayist named Rabin Yamin, uh, who voiced the demand for Palestinian return during the 50s as the editor of the journal Nair, in which representative of the refugees, such as the Palestinian lawyer Elias Kusa, published uh, their articles. And Rabin Yamin is a Galician born and an, um, an observant Jew, um, held, uh, he was par also part of the binational movements uh, during the mandatory period, uh, who uh, criticized the Zionist colonial connection and Zionist reliance on uh, British colonial power. And during, also following the, estab the establishment of the State of Israel and the Palestinian Nakba, continue to hold the binational uh, understanding as a, as a basis for criticizing uh, the, uh, the Zionist policy in Israel and, and suggested a different understanding of Jewish collectivity, what I uh, um, said before. So uh, I think this is my like uh, way to Thank you, thank you, Aviram. Uh, Ina? I really appreciate the, the personal direction of this conversation, and it's, uh, it's great to listen to all of you. Um, I am not one of those stories of Zionist upbringing and waking up process. Um, uh, not, not at all. Uh, my family moved to Israel, which I understand today to be Palestine with the large Jewish immigration from uh, the Soviet Union when it, after the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s. Um, and although I come from Holocaust survivors, I didn't even know we are Jewish until shortly I was told that uh, we are going to Israel. And um, that was um, at the time of this large migration, immigration, there was a very massive institutional pressure on the immigrants uh, from the former Soviet Union, um, not even called immigrants, called olim, so uh, from the word aliyah, ascendance, so to ascend, as in you go to a higher place. Um, there was a lot of pressure to integrate, to belong to their new society, to be grateful for coming, being allowed to come to the promised land and to forget and erase our diasporic roots or even to be ashamed of where we come from. And Avira mentioned the, um, the context of the Mizrahi history. So um, I think there are many po relatable points there. And um, so this pressure to be good Israelis is of course a pressure to participate in colonization and violent racism against Palestinians and racism against Arabs in general. Um, my friend Adi Kunzman writes about it in her book, Violence and Belonging, which I wholeheartedly recommend, but about violence as a practice of belonging. And I think it's, it's very important here. And so honestly, um, so I, I landed in this um, religious school being from a completely secular family. Um, and I don't know, I don't know why this nationalist brainwashing failed to work on me. I was never convinced by the ocean of Israeli flags everywhere and by the narratives of the most moral army in the world and all these memorial days and independence days, I always felt deep alienation from it. And it's not that I felt alienation overall. I felt at home with friends and with the people I love. Um, I can very much relate to the longing for home as I think many of us who come from histories you know, of, of displacement and migration and like each generation of your family moved somewhere else. Um, I, I very much understand what it does on a very deep level and um, 
this sense of rootedness that other people have that you don't. So uh, on, on a very deep level. And so at the same time, I somehow, I never bought into the Zionist homecoming narrative that here, I'm finally home. That's my promised homeland. All of this is ours and that's it. So not at all. And I, I always felt that migration wasn't just this coming back home or ascending. It had ups and downs. It had trauma, it had difficulties. And um, of course there was no space for that in the mainstream Israeli discourse. Um, so I was never an ardent Zionist, but there are still um, two points of change I want to quickly speak to, um, if I still have a couple of minutes. So one is the beginning of the construction of the apartheid wall in the West Bank in the early 2000s, which is when I became uh, more politically active and I started going there and joining protests of families whose homes and lands were being taken away and um, olive trees uprooted, farm lands destroyed. Um, and until that moment, I didn't feel much connection to the land and the country. And there was something in being there with people standing to lose their home and their land that I felt and I recognized very clearly a connection to the place which was real and which, well, now I can theorize, it was not mediated by colonial violence or by colonial ideology. And I somehow recognized it and I was convinced because I know how it feels not to feel at home. And I know the experience of being uprooted and moved for a generation and something in this very dramatic situation of people standing to lose their home um, in the name of my security, right? Um, was, it, it was, it, it deeply shook me and, um, and I think also, of course, um, this is why the Zionist fantasy of, of homecoming is so appealing to people with histories like ours, like this idea that there is a place somewhere in the world where, where you can really be at home. So, um, and, and, and yet my most genuine and perhaps only connection to the land of Palestine was through this experience of solidarity with people for whom this land was home and perhaps even a little bit of envy because of th this connection to home that I never had. Even the connection to nature felt different. I grew up being very nostalgic about the rivers and the forests of Russia, and suddenly I could see Palestine through the eyes of the people indigenous to the land and say, okay, I can see, I can see how, how it can be beautiful. And I don't mean to romanticize, but more like to convey an emotional process of someone who usually lives very much in her head, but those questions of home and belonging and identity and dispossession and uprootedness are, they're not taking place all, only or even primarily in the mind or, or rather the intellectual, analytical and the emotional processes are uh, uh, intertwined. And the second moment I wanted to mention is, is the realization that although my parents moved to Israel to give their children a better life, that's our narrative, the political reality is more than our narrative. And Israel needed us for demographic reasons, basically as a demographic weapon. So there is a moment there of, for me of ref as in refusing to be a demographic weapon, basically. And um, I, I went through this un-Zionism process of first understanding myself as a migrant rather than this ascendant identity Ola, that was put on me. And, um, and then of course, going through um, a, another process of understanding myself, not as a migrant, but as a settler col colonizer, because I, I do find settler colonialism a useful analytical framework, but um, I think we do have a way to go in understanding what it means and, and which political projects it, it calls for. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Th thank you, Anna. I think actually uh, your answer also shows how important it is um, and how relevant it is. Uh, to continue uh, resisting the continuous Nakba, that as, as we call, uh, the everyday displacements that happen and the everyday uprooting of, uh, of, of families, the concentration of Bedouins into smaller spaces, whether in the Naqab or in the, um, or in the West Bank, uh, etc. And all of us keeps, I think, um, uh, showing us that we, um, that this colonial um, state um, um, did not start the Nakba and end it, uh, and it continues to do so until today. And um, um, and therefore, um, they remind us of uh, what even um, one of our in one of our uh, questions here, uh, Mr. Harold Emanuel uh, uh, calls, and I agree with this calling the original sin 
uh, of uh, displacement that happened back in in 1948 um, and 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 continuing to uh, uh, to happen until today. Um, I want to move uh, to ask uh, uh, Peter. Um, you wrote your piece, a Jewish case for Palestinian return. Um, what sort of reactions did you uh, get, whether from uh, Jewish Americans today? Do you feel uh, a shift in uh, Jewish co uh, co uh, communities, um, whether in the United States or specifically in the United States or other places, moving towards more recognition of, of, of Palestinian return? Do you feel that this shift is happening today or are we too far away from uh, seeing that? We're still... Um very far away, I think, from this being a mainstream topic, either in the American political mainstream in Washington uh, or in the American Jewish, what I call the American Jewish establishment. Um, I mean, um, just the conversation about a conditioning of aid, for instance, um, uh, or about any American policy that would um, have some consequences to Israel for Israeli behavior, that's still a marginal position. Right, I mean, that's still only a small minority of Democrats, put aside Republicans in Congress, even support that, right? Um, or let alone in, you know, so, so, so this is, I think to be honest, if I'm honest, that my piece didn't get as much pushback, partly because it was took, it, you know, came out in the midst of the, the, you know, the conflict with Gaza. So people had other things to focus on, but also because it remains actually such a marginal view that a lot of people didn't even feel they needed to respond to it, to be honest. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't, I think there's always the danger when one is a, particularly for progressives that one one sees that, that one, one, one believes that what's normatively, what you believe is normatively right is also what's descriptively happening, right? Um, I think that, so I don't wanna be overly optimistic about that. Um, but I do think that what, um, there is a recognition, I think, um, um, that, that, that the American discourse to some degree is stuck, that the mainstream paradigm of a Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state with no right of return, with Palestinian citizens being second class citizens, that, 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 is not, that this is less and less in touch with reality. It's just that the political costs are, of, of moving beyond that paradigm are so high. And also that I think we just really, there's not a lot that the intellectual framework for, for many people is not there, which has a lot to do with the, the fact that Palestinians are still not that well represented in public discussion. So Palestinians would be the most natural people, I think, to move that conversation past that paradigm. And yet Palestinians are still um, not always that well represented in American public discourse on this. So when, we, when that shift happens, I think then perhaps the conversation of refugee return can start to enter, but I still think um, we haven't crossed that threshold yet. Um, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, uh, Aviram, have you um, seen any shift in, um, um, uh, in, in views about the right of return of Palestinians um, in the Jewish communities that you deal with? Uh, if you could unmute. Sir. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can say that there is a shift, but I might like to share with you uh, an experience I had um, like some month ago. Uh, I, uh, in the recent two years, I teach uh, 11th graders uh, history uh, in high school. And in, uh, in this year, uh, Israeli Memorial Day of the Holocaust, which taken place in the day of my, le in, of my lesson, and uh, following, um, and a week after it was Israeli Independence Day, that I, I told to myself that I should, as a teacher for history, uh, should relate to these uh, issues. So I taught them Rasan Kanfani's uh, return to Haifa. And I'm, I admit that in the beginning, I thought that I should be careful by, while uh, uh, studying this um, novel. This novel and 
but for my own surprise, it was, uh, they took it very, uh, they could hear the, we learned like the, um, the last monologue of Said in the novel where he uh, turned against his own son uh, who was raised by um, a couple of uh, Holocaust survivors and turned against and um, criticizing harshly the Zionist understanding of Holocaust as enabling the Nakba. So we, we learned this uh, paragraph and I was sure that as a teacher, I should be careful for these kids because I have a power relations within my own class. But for my own surprise, they started to uh, absorb it and, and they didn't met this kind of text before. And I think this might, uh, for me, uh, this might uh, bring a, a shred of optimism for, uh, for an option of shift. Well, there is, uh, there's hope, right? Should be hopeful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, Inna, I wanted to, uh, I want to ask you here, um, you have been active in this grassroots campaign um, to end Israeli apartheid. Um, and I know that this term uh, has been mentioned and used by Palestinians now for several years. Uh, it has been a taboo in the um, Israeli community and uh, maybe more general Jewish community, but also the international community uh, worries about using this term. I know that until today, uh, to, to some extent. Um, I can see that now uh, you are active in uh, the campaign to end Israeli apartheid, grassroots campaign. Um, and I can see also that there is a shift even within much you know more mainstream more main, mainstream left wing israelis israeli organizations maybe beit salem um, yashdin also um, have been um, not only using the term but also presenting uh, uh, good analysis um, on the on, on using this term and this concept um, so i want to ask you maybe two things first um, why is it an apartheid, in your view? Um, and secondly, can you tell us more about your campaign? So, I mean, as you said, Munia, Palestinians have been saying this is an apartheid for, for decades. And the question is also, you know, why, like, why is the why is the use of the term apartheid creates more sensation than an actual reality of apartheid for decades? That's I, I think that that's something that you know when whenever people feel um, like very strong about words, then about terminology should should I think ask? Um, um, so well, let me say on, on sort of like the factual and the legal and the historical analysis on why are we talking about apartheid, both Human Rights Watch and B'Tselem and numerous other reports, um, also of Palestinian human rights organizations like al uh, paint very clear picture um, of an apartheid regime, which is based on domination of one group over another group of domination over land and Really, it's uh, land, natural resources, um, labor, um, and and so on. Um, and honestly, as 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 someone who has been active, um, I think it's it's been clear to us for years that without international intervention, it is not possible to shake political reality. Israel has no interest whatsoever in giving up power and dismantling its control over the entire land from the river to the sea, and also its control over the lives of all the people residing in this territory. And not to mention the entire colonial mindset in which racial domination is the natural and the moral way to live. So you will have many people who will say, yeah, it's better for the Palestinians that we control them. Look at what is happening in Arab countries. So, um, 
over over the past you know 20 years i took part in beautiful projects of political education and awareness raising also with communities considered right wing like the one i come from and this work is important but you you just you cannot do them on a scale that would reverse the effects of an entire education system the culture the media the entire the foundational ideology of this society and ultimately you need to change the conditions of life in order to change people's way of thinking and being um you can't decolonize just decolonize people's minds as long as they continue being colonizers there's there's a connection there between the structure and um and the agency. So um, you can do it with a small group on a small scale, and we did it for years, but it's it's not enough in itself, and it's not enough to withstand also the surge in outright fascism of recent decade and a half um, in, um, in, in the Israeli politics. So absolutely, it is outrageous that we need an Israeli and an international human rights organizations to issue a report to say that the reality is what it is. But that that is um, that is the situation, and we are seeing, um, at least on the tactical level, that these reports they do they 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 give a permission to speak about the reality as a reality more, and that they have a potential to be a game changer. So, and the recognition that Israel is an apartheid regime um, is very significant because it also signals to other states that when they support Israel, they de facto support an apartheid regime. And it, it already has a different political weight. So um, it is for states and most importantly for the people in those countries to take a stand. Are you okay with your government supporting an apartheid regime? And clearly in many countries, people are not on board with that. So there's gap between policy and, and public opinion, we, which we must start closing. There's, um, I live in Germany now and, and Germany is one of the, was also one of the last and strongest supporters of the apartheid regime in South Africa. But so, so there's something here about on, on which side of the history do you want to be? But also um, it's very clear that in many of the EU countries and other countries that the very, um, the, the refusal of the politicians to recognize the reality and to take responsibility and to stop support, actively supporting apartheid um, that, that is, does not represent really where the public opinion in those countries is. So, so there's a responsibility on all of us as activists and movements, um, and also those I think with positions in the media um, and and public voice to trying to close this gap. So, those of us who are Jewish Israelis and who refuse an apartheid system based on Jewish supremacy have uh, come together in the past couple of months with all the events, uh, starting with the bombing of Gaza and um, the ethnic ongoing ethnic cleansing in East Jerusalem, uh, um, the apartheid system throughout Palestine, but also inspired by um, the Palestinian uprising throughout Palestine in 48 as well, um, to come together and to call for international intervention. And I see that uh, Rachel posted already the link, which I was about to do. So thank you, Rachel. And so basically, um, I, I think we are saying very clearly also to the states who object to the occupation of the West Bank or the siege in Gaza, but perceive Israel as a democracy that we as citizens can change from the inside, which is something I heard from the parliamentarians quite a bit. And so, I mean, the answer is, you know, we are on it, but we cannot change it. And it is not an, a democracy. It is an apartheid regime. So we call on you to stop supporting it and to stop legitimizing it politically and to stop financing it, stop being complicit in crimes against the Palestinian people and against humanity. So, and just to conclude on this, that, I mean, we are not naive. I don't expect you to endorse BDS tomorrow. But I do believe that it is time for sanctions and we have to demand it today to see it in five or 10 or even 20 years. But the tragedy is that Israel will continue killing families in Gaza and expelling people from East Jerusalem and exercising apartheid across Palestine simply because it can and because there, there, there's simply because it can. Um, and because there, there's, there's no sanctions uh, on this on it to do otherwise. While you know the political dynamics in other countries take their time and people ponder over reports and if it's a pad height, if it's too strong or not too strong, and the EU will continue, you know, issue empty statements and sign on more and more cooperation agreements with Israel with a lot of financing to it and so on. So 
basically it's up to all of us to hold the world's governments accountable and to demand action so um yeah so that's that's the initiative and it was really giving me a lot of hope in the last um yeah, in the last weeks, because some of us are new to activism and some of us have been working on peace and human rights and anti-colonial work for decades. And it, it feels like we should um, very clearly focus on international intervention. Thank you very much, Ina. I will start um, taking from the questions that are in the Q&A um, uh, section here in our uh, in our chat um, and I will start uh, with um, a question uh, so uh, first let me say that I will necessarily have to apologize that I might not be able to uh, get all questions however I will be uh, trying as much as possible to navigate through these questions and uh, if I I can uh, gather two um, in one or something like that, I will do that. But also, I will have to apologize to the speakers that I will not, although I'm sure that all the questions that have been asked are probably interesting to all of you uh, to answer, but um, I will maybe randomly, because I don't know of a scientific way to choose who answers which question, uh, um, uh, ask you for uh, answering specific questions. But if you have a burning uh, desire uh, to also answer a question that I uh, uh, that I ask, uh, uh, please um, please do that. You know, please do. You know, um, tell me. Um, so there is the first question by Ilias, um, um, who is asking about a one state and mixed communities. Uh, basically, he, um, if I can assume that Elias is a he, I'm not sure, uh, uh, but uh, 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 says that uh, he believes in uh, one state, uh, but is it easy to um, and secure um, to have a, uh, uh, no, do you propose to ensure safety and full rights for whichever groups is a minority in the land. So here, um, there is a question about when it becomes mixed culturally and religiously, etc., ethnically, um, and apparently some sort of worry. So let me ask um, Aviram if you can address this question. And basically, yeah, so yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to answer. Um, I think that. Uh, in the discussions of the um, Return Council in Zohot, uh, this question raised and were um, several suggestions to um, take these issues into consideration, like um, creating um, communal um, the courts they that will uh, will um, deal with the um, the land uh, issues and things like that so I'm not sure that I can like say but I think that there were several suggestions that were uh, raised to to uh, ensure the, the possibility of, of uh, creating the uh, option of a shared, uh, of a shared state, which is not uh, based on the uh, colonial structure. Yes. Um, thank you. Okay, I will move to another question. Um, maybe I will ask. Uh, yes, yes, Peter, please. If you don't mind, I, 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 maybe I'll add something on, on, on this question. Um, yeah, please do. Um, I mean, I would start with the, the, the fact that there is one state now, um, um, uh, and there is um, uh, no prospect of it being uh, partitioned um, uh, uh, um, in, the, in the foreseeable future. And, um, uh, and even if it were, um, in the way it's generally envisioned in the mainstream American political discourse, this would not 
Palestinians would still be expected to be, Palestinian citizens would be expected to be second class citizens and Palestinian refugees would not be able to, be, to return. So, so it's not as if um, the, the, um, the real choices that uh, even that, if that were possible, would leave very, very serious questions unresolved. And that does not even, not even on the table. So the question really is, I think, over the longer term, which, 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 uh, what is likely to be more peaceful and stable? One country where you have equality under the law um, uh, or one country where millions of people uh, lack basic rights. Uh, um, and I argued in a piece that I wrote last year that if you look at political science, comparative political science research from around the world, one of the things that you find is that societies in which, in divided societies, that, that political systems in which all groups have access to the political system and people can express themselves politically um, tend to be more peaceful and stable than those where one group is denied access to the political system, right? Because being denied access to the political system, a state that has where you have no accountability is itself a system of violence. If you have no rights vis-a-vis -vis the government that controls your lives, that is inherently violent and that is going to lead to more violence. Um, so that doesn't mean that one equal state by any means in Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel would be would be by easy by any means. But it seems to me if you look at um, uh, if you ask the uh, you know, white South Africans are 10 percent of the population of white South Africa, a much smaller percentage than Israeli Jews would be, even if there were some demographic change. And actually, white South Africans have um, are doing they you know, are doing much better than they would have been had apartheid continued for another 30 years. Right, putting aside the force that force black South Africans are doing better, despite South Africa's many problems, white South Africans, their lives would not have been good if we imagined apartheid lighting 30 more years. Similarly for Protestants in Northern Ireland, right? Um, who's faced some challenges, but they are better off because Catholics in Northern Ireland ultimately were politically enfranchised because it created more justice, not, a, not pure justice, maybe not enough justice, but more justice and with more justice came ultimately more peace. Um, now, one has to think, of course, there are complicated questions and there are a lot of Palestinian writers in particular who've thought about from Ali Abu Nima, Yusuf Munayar, or other, many others who've written about the question of what the state structure might look like. It would need a strong bill of rights, presumably perhaps a binational structure like you have in Belgium or North, where both communities have some autonomy and some ability to block things that would, be, that would be considered threats to their national autonomy and existence. But ultimately, I think that, 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 that ultimately a situation in which everyone has rights is ultimately a, over the longer term, a more peaceful and stable reality than one in which millions of people are denied them. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, um, now, um, Ina. I will ask you this following question from Peter Larson. And I think um, this always um, seems to be, uh, for many people, the difficult question on the right of return. So Peter Larson, uh, who is in Canada uh, and who discusses, I actually know Peter uh, personally also, um, and who uh, discusses uh, Palestine, uh, Israel on a continuous basis with Canadians and even you know, visits Palestine very frequently, uh, not since Corona, unfortunately. Uh, he's saying that every time he, you know, every time uh, the issue of right of return comes up, um, you know, he gets the answer that, well, it's, you know, we don't challenge it legally or morally, but Israel will never accept it. Um, and since Israel will never accept it, then defending it is, waste of time. Um, so his, his question is, what conditions would make a return realistic? And I'm just reading verbatim the question. Uh, but you can feel free to answer in the way you like. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Peter, for the question. I think it's a very good one because I think that many times our political imagination is is being, uh, you know, cut short by people who are saying this is not realistic or not pragmatic. And it's amazing. It's like you know, it's like with COVID. Like 
the coronavirus came suddenly, you know, it's locked down, we forgot our lives before. Now in some places, well, the vaccine apartheid and injustice is a whole different thing, maybe not so different, but in places where the lockdown is lifting and many people are vaccinated, people totally forgot about COVID, like it never happened. So really the, the, the capacity of our societies to get used, you know, like I, I lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union. I, right now I'm speaking to you all from East Germany, which is also a country that doesn't exist anymore. So things, you know, like realities like turn over historically all the time. And what was in, unimaginable and radical and absurd and unrealistic one day is going to be, you know, um, um, is, 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 is going to be, um, you know, history on another. So there's, there's something there in, um, like things are realistic as long as we believe that they are realistic. If you say it's not realistic because Israel will never accept it, I mean, come on, what will Israel accept? I mean, <laughs> if, if, if we orient ourselves on what, you know, um, the old Netanyahu's government or the new, you know, or what Bennett will accept, I mean, you know, we can, like, I, I, I would say we can all just, you know, go home, but even this we cannot do because that's, that's the topic of this discussion. So, I mean, we definitely cannot orient ourselves on whether, you know, like, I mean, that, that's not what we should orient ourselves on. I think what is realistic is, um, I, I mean, first of all, I don't see any option. I don't see any possibility to give up on, on, on the right of return because of um, the whole system of apartheid built on this history and because the Nakba is ongoing. And I do not see how we can move to any of the better visions like the ones that, you know, that Peter was, was sort of drawing for us without addressing that. And of course, Israel doesn't want, but I don't think that an apartheid regime um, and its government should be, you know, the one to say, um, you know, what are the boundaries of what is realistic? Um, so I think that that would be my question and, 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 and my answer. And, and I think, the question is how can we build, you know, the alliances and the political power and the kind of influence that can help us change this political reality, you know, whether Israel feels like it or not, because it will not. Um, and, and how we, we work together, like the, the people who are, you know, in the international community who are in Palestine, also the Israelis in that. So I will, by the way, just... Uh, mention, I, I see the link is still in the chat. So if you have any Jewish Israeli friends, please make them aware of this and invite them warmly to sign because with more, with more voices and with more signatures, we can have more, more political power and, and, and more, um, more that we can do with this. Um, so I think that would be my answer. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, does any one of the other panelists like to uh, address this uh, question briefly, maybe? Or if not, I can go to the next question if, if you feel, if you don't have the burning need to, to answer this question. Okay, so I'll go to the next question. Uh, the next question that I want to address and um, uh, is from Joshua. And... Um, um, and I will um, excuse myself to, uh, if, 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 if that's okay, to maybe uh, suggest an answer myself to this question because, um, not because I'm the Palestinian in this group, but because I am a legal scholar um, and maybe I've, I've actually examined the question. So, uh, but also if, if, if other panelists would like to uh, address this question, uh, that should be okay. I apologize to the panelists that I am intervening, but uh, uh, but I feel that this is something that I have examined myself in my studies. So um, uh, Joshua is, is, is asking about um, um, the right of return. Um, uh, what do you recommend? So basically, um, what do you recommend responding to those who point to other expulsions that were allowed to stand, such as Turkish or Greek, uh, Indian, Pakistani, uh, or for that matter, ethnic Germans expelled after World War II uh, from throughout Eastern Europe. And um, I've examined this myself because I had to examine um, the idea of uh, the right to return uh, for my uh, PhD studies. 
And uh, I um, read this argument actually in, 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 in articles and I've heard it also in discussions. Uh, basically the argument said, that says, uh, well, this exists, uh, this um, uh, idea of exchanging populations based on uh, ethnicity and religion is something that happened in the history. Um, and uh, it's true, it happened in the history. And it's not like something that never happened, unfortunately. However, uh, when we um, say that this is a right, um, uh, let's say from the international law point of view, um, uh, there is enough evidence, uh, for example, from the, uh, at least from the first, uh, second world war, that deportation, um, forcible displacement in general, uh, was prohibited and criminalized uh, in the Nuremberg tribunals. Um, and since then, it turned into customary international law. Uh, every time somebody is displaced from their homes and not allowed the right to return to their homes, uh, this is uh, criminalized and it is always seen that uh, these people who have been displaced have the right to return. Um, this stems from international humanitarian law, that is uh, the law of war and occupation. It also stems from uh, other areas of law, such as the law of uh, uh, nationality, which gives the nationality automatically to people who are habitually resid residing in a specific place, even when statehood changes in that uh, uh, space, from the human rights law, which also was already existent uh, when the Nakba happened in 1948. So we are, uh, when the Nakba happened in that moment in history, uh, in international law, uh, a right to not be displaced um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a right to return for those who have been displaced, uh, already existed and was strong. And that's why the UN General Assembly resolution uh, does not actually create a right to return, but rather recognize a right of return. Um, so um, this right exists legally. It's very strong uh, legally. Um, it's um, uh, so, uh, the, and the only obstacles for its implementation are not that it is not legal. It's just like any other crime happening any other place in the world um, uh, that is not punished. The only reason is that the political conditions do not allow us to, um, you know, uh, to, to, to end uh, this violation of this crime. And this is the same when it comes to the right of return. Indeed, it happened in Turkey, uh, Greece, it happened in India, Pakistan, uh, but this does not create new international law. The fact that a violation happens in one place or another does not create international law, although this has been argued, I've read it in one article, that this creates new precedents and new um, uh, customs, but that's, you know, that's not true. Customary international law, um, so the Nuremberg tribunals, after they were uh, conducted, uh, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution adopting these principles that came from, from the Nuremberg tribunals uh, as, as public uh, international law binding to all states. So in, 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 in brief, I would say we have sufficient arguments in law. The question, unfortunately, is that politics is preventing us uh, from um, establishing actually this right on the ground. Um, would any of the other speakers like to comment on that? Yes, Aviram. Uh, so I'll add something that I think that when we are speaking of uh, like uh, Palestine, uh, juxtaposed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, India, Pakistan, for example, we must think that as we speak of a continuous Nakba from 48 on, we also need to think of the beginning of the Nakba and the starting point in earlier stage. So we need to think of the um, colon Zionist colonizing efforts, yes, and that were prior to 48. And to see 48 as a, a tool in the way to complete these colonizing efforts. And it's totally different from the uh, war which two uh, of war posed by the ways of decolonization in the Indian subcontinent. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think this is a very um, 
important aspect of this uh, difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will move um, to, um, to um, by Harold uh, Harold Emanuel, um, and the first one uh, is um, um, is a question that on, on using the term diaspora as uh, listed in the uh, advertisement of, uh, of of this very uh, talk today. Um, um, and uh, I agree with, with Harold that um, there is good reason to uh, uh, criticize. Uh, and I personally uh, would, would say that's certainly true to criticize uh, the use of the term diaspora, Jewish diaspora, referring to um, you know, Jews who are not in, in, in Palestine, Israel, uh, Inna and Peter. So the first question is, um, uh, Harold is asking, do Peter and Inna think of themselves as living in the diaspora. And he is reminding us that this term stems from the Zionist ideology, thinking that any Jew from anywhere around the world is actually in the diaspora, um, while, you know, they, you know, if, even if they never lived here or never. So please address this question from your point of view. Sure, I'll say something. I, I... So I actually don't agree with Harold that the notion of diaspora or maybe the older notion of Galut exile is a notion that begins with the modern Zionist movement in the late 19th century. It's a movement that has much, much deeper roots in, in, Jewish, uh, in Jewish sources um, uh, that go, that go e even throughout the period in which there was no Jewish political movement for the, rest, for, for the restoration of Jewish sovereignty. Um, now, um, if, if you were to ask me, do I live in, in diaspora? Um, I would say n n not in the sense that I um, believe my life is um, incomplete um, or, 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 or lesser because I live in the United States rather than um, in Israel, Palestine. Um, uh, but I do believe, and this is why I would identify myself as a, as a cultural non-state Zionist, that there is, um, there is something um, very important for the Jewish people um, about having a flourishing Jewish community society um, in Palestine, Israel, um, that that community can uh, achieve things culturally that um, cannot be achieved in, in, uh, in the United States or in Germany or, or Canada. And those things actually, as the Chad Ha'am, you know, the great cultural Zionists hope they would, can actually that cultural production can be in, immensely valuable for Jews uh, around the world. Uh, most obviously would be, for instance, the Hebrew as a, as a modern living language. So, um, uh, so it, in, in that sense, I would say, um, no, I don't think of myself as, um, as uh, living a, a less or incomplete life in that traditional Zionist sense, but I do believe that the, that the Jewish people globally would be impoverished if there were not a flourishing Jewish community, which had some degree of communal autonomy in, in, in Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel. Can I jump in? I'm, I'm, I'd love, I'm, I'm gonna give a bit of a, uh, I, I'm gonna give a different answer. Um, I, I definitely, I think like many of us here um, of Jews and also ex-Israelis here, um, I think of myself in the legacy of socialist Jews who were not Zionist and who believed our homeland is where we are. It's very much a, um, um, it's very much um, a slogan that we refer to. I'm sorry, I have a cat who sounds like a goat here. Um, but I find, I actually, I do find diaspora a valuable and interesting concept. I, it doesn't have to be in relation to Israel as the homeland. It doesn't have to be diaspora in relation to Israel. Although I agree with you that this is how it is primarily used now. But I would like to recall a, um, a scholar and professor of lit literature, uh, Svetlana Boim, who wrote about nostalgia as, as a longing for a home that existed before or that have, has never existed. And so this is this is a type of longing that I very much identify with, and it doesn't have to be this uh, very nationalistic project. 
it can also be reflective recognition of that longing and the understanding that the need for home is is a um a joint is is a, is a com also a human condition um it can be a place of empathy and solidarity with others and it can also embrace the complexities we have in relation to places that are our home or not our home even if somebody tells you it's not your home you know and maybe in some place you feel it is your home or or the other way around somebody tells you here you are home now this is yours and you can say well mm, i'm i don't really feel that way i'm not i'm not convinced and i mean we all especially i think as many times you know so as feminists or as queers or as people who are otherwise you know have complex relations with the societies they come from the, the the idea of home and of chosen home is always very contested and very complex and i think there's something um also in writings of people like Daniel Boyarin about diaspora that doesn't have to be very Zionist or Zionist at all. And there's much, I think, to, to take from that um, for anti-colonial politics as well. But having all that said, I do agree that using it as diaspora without probably all of this long disclaimer I just gave um, can easily fall into, you know, Jews belong in Israel, which for me is very anti-Semitic. Um, thing to say uh, Jews belong wherever we are because that's how it should work with human beings. Thank you, thank you. Um, Can I say something? Yes, please, yes. <laughs> so I'll, it, my, uh, I want to sp speak of a different option to, to think of the Jewish I started with it of Jewish existence in what Jews call Eretz Israel. Yes, Jews have the uh, the term of Eretz Israel, and tra traditional uh, Jewish com communities in Palestine uh, evaluated the, they, their notion of being in Eretz Israel and being in Palestine, which was not connected, which was connected to a uh, to an exilic notion of being in Palestine. Like being in Palestine was part of the identification of Shechina, of the uh, uh, feminine uh, part of God, uh, as didn't left the Western world. Didn't left, uh, so um, being is, be, being in Palestine with being with the, the exiled God. So, um, so I think we we can think of different uh, political theology of being in Palestine. Which we, so this will take our whole discussion of the of diaspora, which is xenocentric, uh, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, from a different from a different understanding. And we can see the ways in which traditional Jewish notions of the land can be useful for imagining the, um, for the colonization. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a question uh, from anonymous attendee uh, asking, um, should everyone be allowed to go back to their original homeland? My family was violently thrown out of Baghdad. So basically, um, we know that the three of you support uh, the Palestinian right to return to their homes in all of historic Palestine. Um, uh, and um, the gentleman or lady uh, asking this question is asking about, you know, if everybody has the right to return. And me being the Palestinian in this group, I would say, yes, everybody is, should be allowed to go to their original home back, a homeland. If your family was uh, displaced from uh, uh, Baghdad, you should certainly have the right to return to Baghdad. But I will also open for the other panelists to address this question. Maybe Peter, uh, you are originally uh, I think Avi Rahman uh, also has a experience of this. I mean, I would say, I would just say I agree with you, Munir. I think that people um, uh, should have the right uh, to return if they want to live in these places, obviously, uh, and they also should have the right to a process that would lead to compensation um, uh, for, for lost property. This has actually been something, um, certainly in the European context, that the organized American, that the organized Jewish organizations have worked very, very hard for. 
um, um, the question of, 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 of restitution for property, then I think a lot of, and have actually been quite successful at it in a lot of cases. Um, um, so I, I would say absolutely. And there, the, you know, there have, the, the different Arab countries have, have had different approaches, to, you know, debates about this question at various times. But I think that the, 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 in truth, you know, the, a lot of the, this discourse really, as it emerged, has not really been about giving um, Jews from Arab countries the right to return if they want to return or the right to compensation. It's been about raising this as an issue as a way of canceling out the Palestinian claim, as if to say, we claim this, essentially the state of Israel claims it on behalf of all of these Jews from the Arab world, and we will then renounce it on their behalf in exchange for Palestinians renouncing their claim, right? Which I think is unfair both to Palestinians and it's also unfair to, you know, Mizrahi Jews or Jews from the, from the greater Middle East who, 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 um, who may not want to have that claim renounced on their, on their behalf. Um, and, and so I think that the, the two conversations, these are both just causes and they should both be pursued, but they don't cancel one another out. And in fact, of course, part of the reason that the Israeli government and pro-Israel organizations have done this is not only because they want to oppose Palestinian return, but of course, because the notion of a, of a, of a return by a Mizrahi Jews to countries in the Arab world would be fundamentally anti-Zionist. Right, it would undo the whole rationale for the Jewish state in the first place. Uh, um, so it's not as if it's, it's an enterprise that the Israeli government would have any interest in. I totally agree with you. I don't see the point in uh, in showing, you know, in, in 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 doing this type of exchange of a Jew from an Arab country and a Palestinian from Palestine that if this one person was displaced and the other should be displaced and uh, you know uh, it, it simply doesn't make sense um, although this is uh, used by uh, the state of Israel to claim an, uh, an unexisting um, uh, exchange of population as they called it nobody exchanged population um, and um, people should have their rights uh, your right to your house is an individual right and I should also note that um, um, research has, um, you know, legal research has also shown that the right of return of, of, of a person is an individual right, not a collective right. It's not something that your leader can give up. Uh, it's your right to your home, your right to your passport, your right to your identity, your right to, uh, uh, to your natural uh, space. This is an individual right. And uh, that's another, um, you know, maybe an added um, uh, argument that I should mention here. Uh, that you know, nobody can expect even that even if a Palestinian leader one day decides to give up the right of return, that this will have any value, uh, not only in locally and uh, you know among the Palestinian people, but even legally. So that's important to know, and uh, I can um, unfortunately see that we are almost the time is almost over. Uh, it's uh, twenty five, so we have around five minutes. And in these five minutes, I should first apologize to the rest of uh, the people who uh, wrote questions. I will not be able to talk, to take more uh, questions. And I will ask all of you to um, maybe give me your final comments. Um, and if your comments can be forward looking to the right, to the Palestinian right to return home, maybe. Um, Rachel Beit Aryeh, who is with us on this call, the director of Zohrot and the staff of Zohrot, many of whom, or probably all of whom, I'm not sure, uh, will be attending this uh, uh, event. Uh, if you have any recommendations for them uh, on how to promote the right to return uh, even more uh, among uh, uh, Jewish communities, uh, whether the Israeli community or other Jewish communities, uh, is something that might be helpful if you have any recommendations, if you have any final thoughts, forward looking. I know that one of our questions was, what is our way forward now from Shahira Hafiz? Okay, so let's end with this, uh, 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 with this question. Um, Avi, Aviram. Um.
I think that uh, to stand with Palestinians, most of all, uh, this is the uh, first uh, thing to do. And for me, as a Jew who lives in Israel, so I think my one of my missions is to create the the uh, try and create to, uh, the background for the option of Palestinian in to create the Israelis who would. Uh, who, who will uh, bring their government to, to, uh, for, to create the option of Palestinian return. Thank you. Um, Peter? I guess I would add by saying, um, I think, again, sitting here in the United States, I, I do think that one thing that one is really see no, really noticing here in the United States that could have implications for our discussion um, about a Palestinian refugee return is there is more of a, a much more of a grappling with questions of historical justice in the United States today than there was 10 or 20 years ago. We've just, for instance, the, new, the fact that Juneteenth is now going to be an American holiday or the fact that just in the last week there was enormous amount of media coverage about the Tulsa massacre, um, uh, or the 1619 project. I mean, when I was growing up, there was very little of this conversation outside of the black community. Um, uh, these things were relatively undiscussed. Um, there's even a conversation about reparations that has started in the United States, still far away from becoming law, but a conversation. And, and this is not just true of the United States. In Canada now, I'm told that um, that they begin hockey games with a recognition of the fact that they are on native First Nation land, right? Again, I think something would have been unconceivable. And if that's happening in Canada, it's possible that we could get to that place in the United States where that becomes a normal thing in the United States too, like it has now become normal in Australia and New Zealand. Again, even that is very far away from tangible moves. But it, again, it's a, it's a sign. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement deserves a lot of the credit for for forcing this reckoning about historical justice in the United States. And it has created a very interesting dynamic because you see that many um, Jewish organizations, very, which have, uh, you know, establishment pro Israeli government Jewish organizations and mainstream politicians in the Democratic Party have embraced this idea, right? So what happens now, what's happened is as a result, their discourse about historical justice in the United States is now very much out of whack with their discourse about historical justice in Israel-Palestine. So for instance, the, the reform movement in the United States, which is the largest denom religious denomination in the United States, have has endorsed the call for reparations. And they've actually made references to the very international law that also guarantees a Palestinian right of return. So in a way, what has happened is a kind of hypocrisy has emerged or a, a, a gap has emerged between the way, not certainly everyone in America, so not, not the Republicans and conservatives, but some in the center left are now talking about the United States and the way they're talking about Israel-Palestine. And I think that, and again, that's because of the activism of groups like Black Lives Matter. And I do think it creates a possibility to then present this discrepancy to people and say, well, do you really believe this? And if you believe it for the United States, then we have to start thinking in a different way about, about Israel-Palestine as well. Um, and so I, I, that would be, that gives me a small degree of optimism or hope at least. Thank you very much. Anna? Well, I believe those of us um, living outside of Palestine or even if uh, our heart is there. So um, the, I think there's one side of the work that we are doing, which is around um, trying to get the um, international community, um, well, trying to hold it accountable for its role in perpetuating and enabling and supporting and financing the Israeli apartheid regime. But um, also, I think those of us who have connection to Jewish communities and the work within the Jewish communities, there's, there's a lot of, like, it's, it's something that we have been discussing recently on, on, on how, um, how the, um, 
a lot of the Zionist ideology and this homecoming fantasy project really also plays and capitalizes on people's intergenerational trauma and fears. And I think there's a really important work in trying to address those fears and also in addressing them, in, but also in ways that don't legitimize causing trauma to others that uh, say, well, it is not okay, even for the fantasy of your safety or your home or, you know, whatever is being, or that there will be, if everything goes horrible here, there's that place to go, which isn't even true. I mean, I don't know why people think they will be so safe in Israel, but um, you know that it's not worth it to this fantasy, becoming a colonizer, becoming an occupier, killing, you know, being complicit in, in mass murder and in expulsion and in, in terrible crimes that are done to others. Because, you know, I think um, there's something in reclaiming our humanity and, and refusing that, which, which I feel important and, and uh, as, as part of the work also to do with the communities we come from. Um, thank you very much. Uh, today I actually um, arrived home almost maybe half an hour before this event and I came from Silwan, uh, which is um, uh, a community uh, or a neighborhood uh, in Jerusalem that is facing uh, um, displacement and what we call in Jerusalem the continuous Nakba. Um, I was hearing to, uh, listening to um, um, the uh, uh, people there uh, telling their stories about uh, not only all the displacement plans and all the course that they keep going to all the time and but also the violence of the settlers the violence of the, of the police and uh, I came uh, back um, down as normal actually now in my uh, day work uh, against the continuous Nakba and the continuous displacement um, but uh, thank you um, to the the uh, three panelists, um, your uh, voices, your strong voices, um, your will, um, your hard work, um, your courage um, is very important. And uh, I am sure that it makes a difference, even though um, now we are unfortunately facing an apartheid regime that um, is very right wing. Um, and very uh, extreme. Um, and uh, it is not easy to see uh, the end of this, but uh, I'm sure that with your voices and with the struggle of all people who seek freedom and equality and human rights um, and, and um, reparation for uh, the victims, um, eventually we will get there. Um, so, uh, I um, thank you actually very much, like my personal thing, that you, um, um, despite the fact that we have been talking about such a difficult topic, but uh, I think this, uh, your uh, work, um, your activism, uh, your scholarship um, actually makes a difference. And, um, um, and uh, I am sure that uh, it will help us to, to get there. So uh, thank you very much uh, to the three uh, uh, distinguished panelists. And uh, also many thanks to um, uh, all the um, uh, people who attended this event today, who asked questions or who commented, uh, or who are uh, at watching us now on, uh, on Facebook. Um, thank you for giving your time to um, learn more about uh, the right of return from uh, um, the perspective of uh, Jews and Israelis who support it, um, because it's important to always remember uh, this voice. And um, many thanks to Zuchrot for uh, its uh, continuous hard work uh, uh, um, towards the right of return. I am sure we will get there sooner or later. Um, that's something that will happen. There is no uh, doubt, actually, whether we live to see it, we don't live to see it, that's a different question. However, I'm sure it, it will happen eventually. Uh, but, um, you know, by uniting all of us here, uh, uniting towards uh, establishing this goal, towards justice, 
uh, by emphasizing uh, our real identity, which is the human identity, uh, I'm sure that we will get there. So thank you very much. Um, and um, and uh, salam to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.